I wrote a, a statistics textbook in 1971, which is by and large stood the test of time. But the one thing I got completely wrong was <laughs> the limitations of p-values. And I came to see these, like you know, many other people, through thinking about screening tests, because screening tests are very much in the news at the moment because of the because of COVID. And this is a, a, an illustration of the problems they pose, which is now quite commonplace, but I'll just go through it quickly. Suppose you test 10,000 people and that one in a hundred of those people have the condition, say COVID, and 99% don't. So the prevalence in the population you're testing is one in a hundred. So you have a hundred people with the condition and 9,900 who don't. If the specificity of the test is 95%, five percent false positives this is, is very much like a, a null hypothesis um, to test of significance but you can't get the answer without considering the alternative hypothesis which null hypothesis significance tests don't do if you've got one percent i've got 100 people who have the condition if the sensitivity of the test is 80%, that's like the power of a significance test, then you get 80 true positive negatives. So the total number of positive tests is 80 plus 495, and the proportion of tests that are false is 495 false positives on the total number of positives, which is 86%. 86% of false positives is pretty disastrous. And it's not 5%. It's not, most people are quite surprised by that when they first come across it. Now, we can do something similar for significance tests, though the parallel, as I'll explain, is not exact. Suppose we do a, th a thousand tests and in 10% of them, there's a real effect. And in 90% of them, there is no effect. If the significance level so-called is 0.05, then we get five false positive tests which is 45 false positives, but, and that, that's as far as you can go with, uh, with, with, with uh, a null hypothesis significance test, but you can't tell what's going on unless you consider the other arm. If the power is 80%, then we get 80 true positive tests and 20 false negative tests. So, positive tests is 80 plus 45 and the false discovery risk is the number of false positives divided by the total number of positives which is 36 percent percent so the p-value is not the false positive risk the type 1 error rate is not the false positive risk but the difference lies not in the numerator it lies in the denominator in that example of the 900 100 tests in which the null hypothesis was true, there were 45 false positives. And so, look, look at it from the classical point of view, the false positive risk would turn out to be 45 over 900, which is 0.05, but that's not what you want. What you want is the total number of false positives divided by the total number of positives, which is, uh, 0.36, as, as I said, the false positive risk in that case is 36%, not 5%. But now we have to come to a slightly subtle uh, complication, which has been, it's been around since the 1930s and it was made very explicit in 
by Dennis Lindley in the 1950s, yet it is unknown to most people, which is very weird. The point is that there are two different ways in which we can calculate the likelihood ratio, and therefore two different ways of getting the false positive risk. A lot of writers, including Ionidis and, and Rackholder and many others, use the P less than approach. That's what that tree diagram gives you. But it is not what is appropriate for interpretation of a single experiment. It underestimates the false positive risk. What we need is the P equals approach, and I'll try and explain that now. Suppose we do a test and we observe that P equals 0.047 then all we are interested in is how tests behave. They come, come, come out with P equals 0.047. We aren't interested in any other different p-value. That p-value is now part of the data. The tree diagram approach I've just been through gave a false positive risk of only 6%. If you assume that the prevalence of true effects was 0.5 prior. One six percent isn't much different from five percent, so it might seem okay. But the T tree diagram approach, which although is very simple, asks the wrong questions. It looks at all tests that gives P equal to or less than 0.05, the P less than case. If we observe P equals 0.047, then we should look only at tests that give P equals 0.047, rather than looking at all tests which give P equal to or less than 0.05. If we're doing it with simulations, of course, as in my 2014 paper, then you can't uh, expect any test to give exactly 0.047, but what you can do is look at all the tests that come out with P in a narrow band around there, say between 0.045 and 0.05. And this approach gives a way of looking at the problem. It gives, it gives a, a different answer from the T-gram, T-tree diagram approach. If you look at only a test that give P equals, P values between 0.045 and 0.05, the false, false positive risk turns out to be not 6%, but at least 26%. I say at least because that assumes a prior probability of there being a real effect of 50 50. Here are the top search results. Oh, bloody hell. Shut up, Google. Um, if only 10% of the experiments had a, a real effect, a prior of 0.1 in the tree diagram, this arises to a disastrous 76% of false positives. That's, that really is pretty disastrous. Now, of course, the problem is you don't know this prior probability. I'm going to skip this slide for speed. It just goes through the uh, actual numbers that I got in the 2014 simulation paper. Now, the problem, as always with Bayes' theorem, is that there exists an infinite number of answers. Uh, my approach is certainly not unique. Uh, no approach is unique when it comes to Bayes. In fact, not everyone agrees with this, but it is one of the simplest approaches. What I do is look at the likelihood ratio, that is to say the relative probabilities of observing the data given two different hypotheses. One hypothesis is there's a zero effect, that's the null hypothesis. And the other hypothesis is that there's a real effect of the observed size. That's a maximum likelihood estimate of the, uh, of the real effect size. Notice that we are not saying that the effect is, is exactly zero, but rather we are asking whether a zero effect explains the observations better than the real effect. Now, this amounts to putting a lump of probability on there being a zero effect. If you put a, a, a prior probability of the 
of 0.5 would draw there being a zero effect, in other words, a prior odds are one. That's regarded by some people as being over skeptical, though others might regard 50-50 chance of the hypothesis being correct as high, given that most bright ideas turn out to be wrong. Certainly, if you were screening a thousand drugs, congeneric con drugs, you'd be very lucky if 10% of them were effective. So what I can say, and this is uh, given some substance in some of the papers I've written, that if you are willing to test a point null, uh, in other words, put a, a lump of probability on the null hypothesis, then there are several methods of doing that, and they all give similar results to mine within a factor of two or so at least. This, this tweet sums it up, at least Bayesian's attempt to find an approximate answer to the right question instead of struggling to interpret an exact answer to the wrong question, that being the p-value. 